thank you very much. That's a wonderful introduction, and I appreciate that so much. It's uh, really an honor to be here. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad that we've been able to do The Real Truth About Health this year as, a, as an online event. Uh, it was a real joy to be at the Real Truth About Health conference last year in Long Island and to present there uh, January of 2020. So hopefully everyone can hear me okay and um, feel free to uh, know that we'll be having a Q&A session a little bit later uh, after I do in my, the main presentation. Uh, you can also uh, say any questions you may have or comments in the chat and uh, I'll get to that hopefully uh, later. But anyway, I'd like to dive right in. And uh, so the, the main idea here with this lecture is food as medicine and to try to go more deeply into understanding the, un the, um, the essence of what health actually is, the real truth about health, and to expand our idea of health beyond simply our physical health, because I think um, that's what we usually think of. We think of, I wanna be healthy and that's important. There's no question that our physical health is important for us as, as human beings on this planet, for ourselves and for others uh, to be effective, to be happy. You know, Remember what Albert Schweitzer said, he said the key to happiness is good health and a short memory. And uh, both of these are important, the good health, to, to have energy in the morning and to wake up and to be able to fulfill our functions that we love to do really requires us uh, to be uh, someone who takes responsibility for our health. And a short memory, of course, refers to being in the present moment, which is really connects to the second part of my talk today, which is Zen and the art of healthy living. Uh, I think the Zen tradition, which is a, a tradition within the Buddhist tradition, which is a tradition within the world's spiritual wisdom traditions uh, as part of the human heritage that we all share is a tremendous uh, uh, reservoir of, of wisdom that we can uh, tune into. The, the Zen tradition has the word, Japanese word shojin. Shojin is an ancient word that means to eat a plant-based diet for ethical reasons. <clears throat> and so it actually goes much older than uh, the word vegan. Uh, even though veganism is a, a wonderful English word, but it's, um, and in some ways it's broader than shojin, but it's a, again, a reminder that veganism is not some newfangled hippie idea. It's actually an ancient wisdom tradition that goes back thousands of years. <clears throat> I remember when I was a Zen Buddhist monk in Korea, back in the 1980s, I was in a monastery there and I realized that they had been practicing what we would call vegan living for about 750 years since the, I think it was the 1100s or, or somewhere around there. And uh, so there was no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no wool, no silk, no leather, no killing of animals or mosquitoes even. You just tried to live a life uh, of kindness and respect for other expressions of life. So I would love to be able to share uh, about the broader meaning of health. That's the basic idea that health is not merely our physical health. Our physical health is important, but there are other dimensions of health. So I'm going to go ahead, I think, and just uh, talk a little bit about these. And, and I'm going to do a short PowerPoint presentation just at the beginning. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and, uh, and do that now. And hopefully it won't take too long. <clears throat> so uh, to just set this up. And so uh, the, um, the main idea is that our physical health is connected to all other dimensions of health. And let's see here if I can get this thing going. Um, so if we, um, there we go, I'll share this now. And then uh, we'll see that the, um, the uh, <clears throat> this is the World Peace Diet. Okay, good. So we'll see that the, um, here we go, physical health, mental health, cultural health. These are the three outer aspects of health that I wanna talk a little bit about. And then we also have, besides those three, um, we have psychological health and uh, spiritual ethical health. So, uh, so this is the thing to understand, I think, is that 
environmental health, cultural health, and physical health uh, are all interconnected, and uh, and even more uh, are psychological and and uh, and spiritual health. And so those white lines that I just put in are just to, to remind us that every single aspect, every dom domain and dimension of our health is completely interconnected with every other one. So uh, the environmental health aspect is critically important because essentially if we're drinking water that's polluted, if we're breathing air that's toxic, if we're eating food that's grown in soil that's contaminated and so forth, we're not going to be healthy. So uh, this is very important. Cultural health. If you live in a society where uh, there's no equality or justice or freedom, where there's a lot of uh, just uh, oppression and exploitation and so forth, that's devastating also to our physical health. So both of these are critically important and they're interconnected and our cultural health and our environmental health affect each other in many ways. It's very interesting to see. Uh, and then our physical health, of course, uh, is part of this because if we're taking drugs because we have diabetes or other diseases, uh, those go through us and end up going back into the water and affect uh, animals. And then if we eat those animals, there's something called the circle of poison, which is basically that all the toxins that we manufacture that go into the environment for uh, as pesticide, herbicide, or fungicides, or the breakdown of uh, of waste of various kinds and pollution and so forth ends up basically in our food and then very often is recycled back into, into nature again. So nature is always trying to cleanse, but our human activity in many cases uh, is concentrating these toxins. So we have uh, environmental, physical, and cultural health. These are the, the sort of material dimensions of our health and they're important, but the other two dimensions, psychological health and spiritual health, uh, have been in many ways uh, ignored in, think, in talking about our physical health. And I think we have to realize that these are huge. Our relationships have a, play a tremendous role in our physical health. Our, and our psychological health is connected to the environment and to our society, of course, our culture. And spiritual health uh, is also critically important to our physical health and to our psychological health. Spiritual health has to do with telos, with our purpose, it has to do with our ethics and uh, living our life uh, with a, with an, uh, in an authentic way where we have meaning. And if we don't have that, uh, everything suffers because this is really the foundation of physical health. We get up in the morning, we have a purpose and all of our cells and all of our organs and systems are activated by our mind and by our spirit and the, the mind that is resonating with and our emotions that are resonating with uh, the purpose that we have for our life, which is a purpose that is hopefully something that is authentically meaningful for us. That's transcendent in the sense that it helps to connect us to the bigger picture and that we're here to bring a blessing to the world and to bring our own unique blessing and to be creative and to contribute. So if we are missing these things, we can be eating the most healthy organic food, but maybe our health will be pretty bad because uh, psychologically, perhaps we feel disconnected and unhappy and, uh, and like we're not really living our life authentically. And so this will uh, work always against our, our health. So the, the thing to understand here, the foundation of everything that I'm talking about today is that we are all born into a society that is essentially organized at its living core around animal agriculture and that animal agriculture devastates and harms and er erodes all five of these domains of health. It is not ever in any way helping. It's harming all five of these directly, continuously, without stop. And if we are not clear about that, then we are going to be finding that our health is going to suffer, essentially, um, both individually and collectively. Animal agriculture is absolutely notoriously wasteful of resources. That's the thing we have to really understand in terms of environmental health and really all of them. But uh, to, from a basic uh, just efficiency point of view, you can't think of a more destructive and wasteful uh, way of eating 
than to grow enormous quantities of corn and soy and alfalfa and wheat and other grains and legumes. And then instead of feeding them directly to people, to feed them to imprison cows and pigs and chickens and factory farm fishes. Uh, and actually, it's good to remember that two thirds of the fish we're eating now are factory farmed, very toxic, uh, polluted flesh in these fish. But to feed all this grain to these animals who then convert what could be healthy grain, essentially uh, carbohydrates and fiber and vitamins and minerals into saturated fat, cholesterol, acidifying and inflammatory animal protein and huge amounts of nitrous oxide, methane, uh, and toxic waste that ends up going back into the water, back into the land, into the atmosphere, destabilizing uh, climate and destroying uh, the health of aquifers, of ecosystems, depleting aquifers, the amount of water that's needed. It's just uh, really tragic. It's such a tragedy of ignorance uh, on the part of humanity and the part of most human beings don't realize uh, the wastefulness of this. I mean, and basically when you look at the, the billions of tons of food that we eat every year, 85% actually that we eat uh, is uh, plant-based foods. They're actually directly plant-based foods. We're eating rice and, and corn and vegetables and fruits and so forth. And they are grown on merely 6% of the land of the earth, of the, uh, of the land area of the earth grows that 85% of the food. However, uh, the, the other, another 45% of the Earth's surface uh, land area is used to grow animal-based foods, meat, dairy products, and eggs, and that's only 12% of the food that we're eating uh, in, in, by weight. So, and then the other 3%, it makes up the 100%, is basically fish, uh, aquatic animals. So we're completely attacking and destroying uh, our oceans for, 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 for fish. And we feed these fish not only to us, to human beings, uh, but we feed these fish also to cows and pigs and chickens. Scientists discovered that if you enrich the feed of these animals uh, by feeding them foods that they would never eat, it's comical to think of a cow trying to catch a fish, right? But cows are eating enormous quantities of fish because scientists discovered that they put on weight uh, more quickly and that's pro basically profitable. So we had this massive attack on oceans. If any of you have had the chance to see the new documentary, Sea Spiracy, it just came out, but I highly recommend seeing that. It really shows how we have not been told the truth about the leading cause of the destruction of oceans, which is fishing, overfishing and fishing in general is, uh, is what's really devastating. And it's not just for humans, there's huge amounts that are fed to, to cows and pigs and chickens and to other farmed fish. Salmon, for example, are farmed and they're fed huge quantities of other fish, trout and tilapia. And we have factory farming of fish. I mean, we have, for example, in Mississippi, huge quantities of grain go to feed catfish and trout and other fish that are fed to either to people or to chickens and cows and pigs. So feeding these animals to each other, and these are animals that would never eat each other, is very devastating to their health. Uh, they're not designed for these. And so they're, so they're given huge, again, quantities of antibiotics, as well as over 10,000 different drugs and hormones that are routinely injected into these animals and mixed into their feed in order to manipulate them uh, you know, pharmaceutically and also to try to get them to live long enough before they're slaughtered. So we're eating all these hormones and these toxic chemicals that concentrate as well, as, as I discussed in the World Peace Diet, we're eating the terror and fear and pain of these animals. So from an environmental point of view, animal agriculture is utterly destructive um, to our ecosystems on every level, to the soil erosion, water depletion, water pollution, habitat destruction, species extinction. We're in the middle of the largest mass extinction of species now in 65 million years, driven by animal agriculture and by essentially this incredibly absurdly wasteful way of feeding human beings. If we would just eat the food directly, we could feed everyone on a fraction of the land. And for example, in the United States, we eat probably more meat and dairy than virtually any other country in the world. And we have among the highest rates of liver disease, kidney disease, uh, autoimmune disease, breast, prostate, and colon cancer, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, strokes, the very diseases that are linked uh, with 
uh, with animal-based food. So we're suffering in that way in the United States. And I think it's essential to realize that uh, if we continue on this path, we are uh, not going to be, it's, it's completely unsustainable. So to see that the environmental health uh, and, and the converse of that environmental devastation is linked to animal agriculture gives essentially the implicit teaching, which is the very good news, the great wonderful news that we could dramatically and very quickly heal our environmental problems by moving to a plant-based way of eating according to the National Academy of Sciences and very other, you know, other very conservative uh, scientific groups, we are basically um, using about uh, between 12 and 15 times as much land as we need to be. For example, a vegan is using only one twelfth the amount of land as someone eating a standard Western diet. So it's not just twice or three times as much. We're talking about 12 times we could reduce the amount of land we're using, 12 times. So when we just extrapolate that out to the population, we're talking about essentially as we move away from eating animal-based foods, away from fish and dairy products and eggs and animal flesh, then we are creating the foundation of abundance. The earth is abundant. How, I know all of you have noticed by now that this earth is enormously beautiful. It's beautiful, it's exquisitely uh, interconnected. Uh, it has a tremendous amount of intelligence invested uh, in, in, in all the animals and plants that are here. And we are systematically attacking that. And uh, as we attack the intelligence of the earth uh, through animal agriculture, we're attacking our own intelligence. But to understand that the earth is abundant, that we could easily feed all 7.8 billion of us if we would move to a plant-based way of eating. Every, right now, we're all, according to anyone who studies the world hunger problem, we're growing enough food every year to feed 12 billion people. Some people say as much as 15 or even 20 billion people if we would just eat the food directly. But because we're feeding it to animals and they're converting it, we have hunger. So this moves us into the cultural health to realize again that one of the driving forces behind war and conflict in the world is injustice and inequality and hunger. And, if, and, and this is a terrible uh, weight that we have. We have, it's gotten, gotten much worse actually in the last year due to the COVID ep epidemic, uh, but we have a, roughly a billion of the 7.7 .7 billion or so of us on this earth who are chronically hungry and starving. And how is that possible when we're growing enough food every year to feed 12 to 15 to 20 billion people? Again, I've already explained it. It's because of the wastefulness of animal agriculture. And so when we have a situation where people are going hungry, where mothers see their little kids starving, uh, you're not gonna have harmony and, and peace without justice. So uh, it's well understood that food shortages are the driving force behind conflict in the world. And that conflict uh, is, is harmful to all of us. Uh, we have to understand a lot of it has to do with economic injustice. And basically the fact is that it is the societies that are less uh, industrialized that pay the biggest price. When we live in highly industrialized nations, we have more high powered economies. And it's not that difficult for us to drive up the price of grain on the world market uh, to a point where people in less industrialized nations who don't have high powered economies uh, they can't afford it. They, they don't have that kind of spending power that they can buy the grain that we're just feeding to our animals. And so what we're seeing happening all over the world is that people are getting forced off of their land. The land is being bought up by large, wealthy uh, individuals like Bill Gates and, and huge corporations and financial institutions. And they're using the land to grow genetically engineered corn and soy and alfalfa to feed, to imprison cows and pigs and chickens. And then the food is exported from, from places like Ethiopia and, and other places where people are going hungry to Europe and the United States. And the, right now we're cutting down Brazilian rainforests at three to four acres per second, which is completely unsustainable to grow soybeans, not for human consumption, but for uh, for livestock feed, which is then then shipped to China and the United States and Europe. Wow. So we're paying for and destroying these ecosystems. And it's very important for us to understand that through taking out our wallets and paying for meat, dairy products and eggs. So it's a direct consumer action. So it's essential for us as consumers and citizens in this world 
to realize that the most powerful way that we vote with our is with our um, <clears throat> with well, our wallets and our dollars. So our cultural health uh, is traumatized by animal agriculture through inequality, injustice, and war and conflict. Uh, there's a, I remember I used to teach college courses in philosophy, and right there, back 2,500 years ago, uh, Plato in the Republic has Socrates saying very clearly, if we want to eat meat, then we'll have to go to war. And they all agree because they know that it takes a lot of land. You need more land. You need more water. You've got to grow food for these people, for these animals. And so that means you're going to go to war. So, and then the other thing just to remember, I'll just say briefly, is the fact that the workers who have to unfortunately kill these animals and imprison them and force them onto the rape racks and steal their babies and so forth, these workers, and we have whole armies of people that have to do this work, if we're going to eat animal-based foods, these workers have the highest rates of suicide, drug addiction, alcoholism, spousal abuse, child abuse. They basically go back into their families, into their neighborhoods, and inflict terrible damage on themselves and people around them because of the horrible, violent work they're doing. They have what's referred to as perpetrator-induced traumatic stress disorder. So understand that animal-based foods are just absolutely filled with trauma. There's a trauma of the poor cows and pigs and chickens who are killed. There's a trauma of ecosystems that are being cut down and destroyed and polluted. The trauma of indigenous people who are being forced off of their land by ranchers who are killing and torturing them. The trauma of the workers who are killing these animals and abusing them. The trauma of wildlife, uh, free living animals that are who are losing their habitat and, and being and, and dying basically all around us. This is happening in the United States. We have, for example, in the United States, uh, a department uh, within the USDA, it's called Wildlife Services, uh, uses our taxpayer money every year to kill millions of animals, wild free living animals like bears and bobcats and mountain lions and prairie dogs and uh, skunks and otters and all kinds of birds like eagles and and ferrets, I mean, all, all kinds of, pretty much any animal that you can name. If you go to the website of Wildlife Services, you will see us uh, as taxpayers paying to kill these animals because ranchers and farmers don't want any other animals out there. They want just their, their cows or their sheep and every other animal uh, should be killed and destroyed and gotten rid of like we're doing to the free living horses, for example, they're all being round up and killed right now. So it's very important uh, to see the webs of trauma that we're causing. And then of course that food you know, ends up on our plate if we're eating animal-based foods and then it goes into our body. And now we get to the physical health aspect and this causes trauma, I mean, to our bo physical body. <laughs> our body is not designed to be eating animal-based foods. The saturated fat, as I said earlier, and cholesterol don't have mechanisms to take care of those very well. Then the protein in animal-based foods uh, is hard for us to metabolize because it's very large molecules. Uh, Plant-based proteins are much higher quality proteins. They're smaller and more easily break, uh, easy for us to break down to their essential amino acids, and then we can recombine them into the proteins that we need to be healthy. So it's very well understood that if we eat a high protein diet, we're going to be creating um, autoimmune diseases. Type 1 diabetes, for example, is directly related to dairy. Dairy, dairy products, I mean, you can't imagine a more unhealthy product. We're not little calves. We certainly shouldn't be eating dairy products, but meat and fish, all these eggs, they're all carcinogenic. It's a lot of uh, research has been done showing this. I'm sure other uh, presenters are going into that more in depth. So I won't, I can talk a long time about that, but I'll, I'll kind of stop there and just go briefly now into the psychological and spiritual dimensions, because I think that's where it gets even more important. I mean, the, the outer dimensions are important of the environment and, and our society and our physical health. But what we are as beings, what we are as beings, we are consciousness. Our actual emotional health, our intellectual clarity, our spiritual uh, wisdom. I mean, these are the things that are really important. How we are, the quality of our awareness as we go through the day, that's where the big toll is on animal agriculture. It attacks our basic being our psychological health, because the underlying uh, messages that we have uh, 
been eating since we uh, were raised in the society since since birth are not in our best interest. So the main thing to understand, first of all, is the fundamental truth, which is that nobody eats animal foods out of any kind of a free choice. It's never a free choice. It's all, the only reason anyone's eating animal foods is because they're following orders. That's the reason. That is the reason anyone eats animal foods. We're eating them only for one reason. It's because we're following orders that were basically injected into us ritually, uh, inserted into our consciousness from birth, from probably before birth, uh, while we were still in the womb, by very well-meaning, loving people, our own parents and teachers and friends and neighbors and relatives and the church and and uh, doctors and the media, they, I, I was surrounded, you know, in, in my own life with well-meaning people that wanted me to eat a lot of meat, dairy products and eggs and from, from infancy. Uh, and they had all the reasons, right? We have, because you need the protein, you need the calcium and God just gave us these animals to eat and so forth. So that's uh, their purpose. And so we're eating in a ritualized way. Anthropologists understand this very clearly that essentially, um, the, the, the main thing that every society does is it transmits its values from generation to generation, whether uh, you're an Eskimo or you're, or you're in, the, in, the, um, in the rainforest, whatever, or, or here in the, a modern uh, post-industrial kind of a society, they all do the same thing. Every society transmits its values from generation to generation through the institutions of that society, through the language of that society, and most importantly of all, through the rituals of that society. And the main ritual in any society is, is the meals. When you're sitting down and eating food, we're not just eating food, we're eating a whole constellation of attitudes about our relationship with each other, with nature, with animals with the cosmos and it's in the case of animal agriculture, we're eating a whole constellation of attitudes that are toxic, that are harmful to us. Uh, I'll, I'll just say a few of them right now briefly. One of them is, the most important one probably, is we're eating a mentality of disconnectedness. The, the basic fundamental subtext of every meal is don't make the connection we're eating bacon, right? I mean, I remember when my mother said, well, we're having bacon this morning. I was always the first one at the table because I loved bacon, right? All that fat and salt, yum, yum, yum. <laughs> Who's not gonna love that, right, the little kid? I love bacon, but if my mother had told me what it was, if she had said, well, you know, we're gonna have the flesh of an animal who has confined her entire life in, in, a, in a, within metal bars where she couldn't even turn around, she was banging her head against the bars, literally driven insane. And then finally they pulled her out, hung her upside down by one leg, slashed her throat, and now we're gonna eat her flesh. I, I would have been horrified. I would have said, you want me to eat that? I don't even wanna hear about it. I mean, come on, I mean, can we have some oatmeal and a banana or something else, <laughs> right? I mean, but we don't know what it is, right? With these rituals, uh, we're just given the flesh and secretions of horribly abused animals by loving people telling us that we have to eat this violence and this toxicity, and they don't know any better because they were similarly ritually indoctrinated by their parents, and it goes back through the generations, 10,000 years when we started herding animals. So we're born into a society with a very toxic rituals around food that basically teach us to disconnect to not make the connections, to not look deeply, to not feel deeply, to not care deeply, to not listen deeply. And so if we're raised in a society where every day, three times a day, in the most powerful ritualized way imaginable, we actually eat, it becomes the very cells of our body, what we're eating goes into us, becomes the, the cells of my brain that, that thinks and my heart that beats and my stomach, we're eating, the to toxicity and violence and misery and terror and fear and pain and despair, uh, how can we expect then to be creating a society of peace and joy and love and radiant health for ourselves while we're destroying that for animals, for other living beings? And we all know anyone who's had a companion animal like a dog or a cat or uh, another companion animal, you know these beings are beings who have interests, whose interests are to them, as important to them, really as our interests are to us. So if we're going to systematically not care about their interests, uh, we inflict incredibly 
uh, just painful experiences on them from birth until death, where they're subjected to chronic fear and acute fear and chronic pain and acute pain their entire lives, and then eat that and feed that to our unsuspecting children, we're creating a situation of in intense disease from the point of view of psychological and spiritual dimensions. And the fact that we are such a materialistic society that we don't even recognize that, that we think it doesn't matter, shows the depth of the, of the depravity and the disconnectedness that we have inflicted upon ourselves through animal agriculture. Animal agriculture is the Trojan horse. I used to teach college courses in mythology. I mean, the Trojan horse is such a great image because the, the purpose of the Trojan horse was to destroy the people of Troy, right? I mean, they, the Greeks made this horse that looked so attractive and it was like beautiful, wonderful thing. And they brought it into the gates and they loved, wow, we got this beautiful horse, fantastic. And it just destroyed them. They killed and raped all the people and, and burned the city. That's what animal agriculture does to us. It's absolutely a Trojan horse. We take it in, we're told as little kids, oh, this is how you get your protein. This is what, how the West was won. This is what made America great and you know, whatever it is. And it does nothing but completely destroy our every dimension of health and happiness for ourselves. It does just what it, it does to us, what it does to animals. If we were born as a cow or a pig, I would not have to explain this. We would understand very clearly because we would be experiencing the, the horror of it ourselves. But psychologically, to be inflicting that kind of pain and then numbing ourselves, disconnecting from it, it creates what Carl Jung referred to as the shadow. The shadow is psychologically what we are, but what we say, no, I'm not that. And, when, and, when, and the shadow archetype is a living force within the humanity, within us as individuals and within our society. And it does two basic things. Number one, it forces us into denial, to dumb us down, to pretend that we don't know what we're doing. And number two, it, it forces us to project that on others. So, so then, so we say, oh, we're just good loving people. We just like to have a good steak and a milkshake, but we're good, good caring people. But there's these other people over there that are really evil and cruel and violent. So we project our own violence and we see it on other people. We have to build a lot of nuclear weapons to go attack them because they're the bad ones. So this is, this is the psychological uh, dynamic that animal agriculture enforces upon us. So if we want to eat animal foods, if we want to have a good steak and a milkshake, go right ahead. But you're going to have nuclear war. You're going to, you're going to wipe out. You're going to become slaves yourself. We'll become slaves ourselves if we're going to continue enslaving animals. And we can see it happening. So we have to really wake up. I mean, this is these things I'm talking about are not abstract philosophical concepts. These are the living reality of our planet right this minute. And it has been. I've been warning for decades that if we continue on this pathway, we will ourselves end up as livestock. And we can see that happening because the disconnectedness of animal agriculture uh, it goes right to the core of our being. And it's not our fault. That's the thing to understand. It's not like we human beings are inherently flawed, uh, that we just, there's something about us that's going to make us want to kill each other and have wars and injustice and inequality and violence and all this stuff. That's not it. The fact is we've just been born into a culture with an obsolete food system and obsolete food rituals. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this in a few minutes. I'll go into the history of it briefly. But basically, from a psychological point of view, we have to understand that the disconnectedness uh, it really is a reduction of our intelligence. I used to, I have my PhD is in education. And essentially, when we're talking about education, we're talking about, in many ways, about intelligence, about cultivating intelligence. Our educational system is not about cultivating intelligence, by the way. Our intelligence uh, is, in many ways, uh, reduced by our educational system which is based on us uh, regurgitating and, and so forth. But that's a, a different thing. But the thing to understand is that real intelligence is the capacity to make relevant connections. That's what intelligence is in any system, in a human being, in an animal, in a society. It, it's the ability to make relevant connections and respond appropriately to feedback. Well, with animal agriculture and the ritual of eating animal foods, systematically reducing our capacity to make connections and to respond to feedback, then what animal agriculture does is it systematically reduces our intelligence as an individuals and as a society and explains a lot. 
It explains how easily manipulated we are, how naive and gullible we are, how our great scientists can't seem to figure out uh, how to do a better food system, our politicians, why it is that with all our brilliance, and we have brilliance, uh, and intellectual capacity and, and uh, wisdom and so forth that we actually have, potentially, we blunder along cutting down and destroying and, and harming uh, our, our planet and each other and animals uh, in, a, in a frenzy of, of violence and stupidity, essentially, because animal agriculture forces us to disconnect from our natural wisdom and capacity and abilities. And also, not just intellectually and cognitively, but also affectively, emotionally, we have to numb ourselves. If, we, if we're eating bacon or chicken or a burger or a fish stick, we have to emotionally disconnect and see it as an it. It's just an it, it's a, the cow is an it. And we have to uh, completely obliterate the I-thou relationship that Martin Buber talked about, how important it is to cultivate an I-thou relationship, to respect other beings as beings. And, and reduce that to an I-it relationship where it, the, we see others merely as objects to be used and manipulated. So when you have the main fundamental organizing principle of, of a society, which is what animal agriculture is for our society, it is the living core. There's nothing more powerful than animal agriculture in terms of the core of our society. As I, as I uh, go into in depth in the World Peace Diet, which uh, I don't have time to hear, but, but anyway, it's when that is the core, then out of that, all of the institutions arise. And you have an educational system, a religious system, economic, science, family, government, health, everything is reductionistic. Uh, it, it basically, it's based on reducing everything to mere matter. So materialism is another of the mentalities. The, the devastating impact of materialism can never be overstated. It's when you, when you eat animal foods and you just see animals for 10,000 years and you and buy and sell them by the pound and see them as mere objects uh, without any worth other than what you can weigh, that is inflicting a form of ignorance and, and, and hard heartedness that is again, impossible to overstate. And so the materialism in our society today is uh, we're more materialist than any society in the history of the world by far. And it's gotten us into a situation now where many scientists say we don't have many years left before uh, we'll, we'll go extinct because uh, materialism is not seeing the truth that what we are is not just a material body that was born and will die, that what we are actually is infinite and eternal consciousness. And that is what all beings are. All beings are manifestations of, of eternal consciousness. And when we understand that and see that and awaken to that, then uh, compassion is born in our heart and love and uh, we can no longer harm other beings. And th this is the living wisdom that's inside all of us potentially, but that animal agriculture uh, just suppresses in us. So uh, to understand that, that, that materialism, reductionism, we created reductionistic science, education, religion, uh, it's all reducing uh, beings to commodities. The commodification of life, turning forests into board feet of lumber, turning animals into, you buy and sell them by the pound, turning other human beings merely into resources that we use, we manipulate, we try to manipulate other people to get what we want. We create an economic and governmental system based on manipulation of people. And so whoever, so it's based on might makes right. That's the fundamental thing. Animals are less powerful than us. So we hold them in our hands and we just, just crush them and destroy them. And we do the same thing. The strong do the same thing to the weak, right? That's the underlying uh, message of animal agriculture. It's demonic. Any, any authentic spiritual tradition has to, has to, uh, defend the weak from the strong, has to promote kindness and compassion and respect, and has to promote vegan living, and has to uh, promote nonviolence. That's, that's fundamental. That's the way, that's the way of, 
uh, of spiritual awakening. Spirituality is, is radical and revolutionary. It's based on seeing beings rather than as objects. It has nothing to do with religion, in this, except that it is the inspiration of religion. But uh, spirituality is the truth of the interconnectedness of all expressions of life and understanding that not just intellectually, but actually understanding it in a lived way. So these psychological dimensions, I think, are critical to understand. And another one, uh, besides might makes right, reductionism, disconnectedness, and commodification, another one is the domination of the feminine. And I think this is very important to understand that the feminine dimension of consciousness, which uh, in many ways is the root of, of the spiritual impulse uh, of receptivity to a higher awareness is again, is horribly abused by animal agriculture. The fundamental uh, activities of animal agriculture are to reduce what I refer to in the world peace diet as Sophia. Sophia is the ancient Greek word uh, that means wisdom, actually. Sophia is feminine wisdom. And it's the wisdom that lives in all of us, whether we are men or women, that yearns to love and nurture and protect life. That wisdom is the foundation, really, of a healthy family, right? We can't, as healthy individuals, if I'm as a little baby, if I don't receive that Sophia wisdom from my mother of loving and nurturing and protecting me, uh, I'm not going to be healthy. I'm not going to be healthy physically or psychologically or emotionally or, or socially. And uh, it takes a lot, right, for a mother. I mean, a mother has uh, a lot on her hands and this little baby comes into the world and is a lot of trouble. It'd be a lot easier for her just to say, oh, you know, the heck with that. But the mother love, that Sophia wisdom, loves and nurtures and protect this, protects the baby. And that's the foundation of everything in our society. And yet animal agriculture is always about stealing the mother from the baby. On any animal agriculture, large or small operation, large or small, whether it's a big factory farm or a little backyard farm, it's always the same underlying narrative, the same story, the same action and behavior. I own you. And now I'm going to impregnate you against your will. And now I own your baby and I'm going to kill your baby. Uh, and I'm going to impregnate you again. And I'm going to steal your baby again. And then I'm going to impregnate you again. I'm going to steal your baby again and kill your baby. And then I'm going to kill you. It's a, it's a, that's what it is. And we have to see that very clearly. And it's completely unnecessary. And that's the beauty of all this. I mean, the underlying message here um, is the good news that all of this uh, is completely unnecessary. So I just, uh, for some reason, lost my, <laughs> my PowerPoint here. But um, I'll go ahead and maybe um, go, well, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more and then I'll, I'll bring up the other uh, aspect. So, um, so the underlying idea is we see these five dimensions of health. We see the, the psychological dimension I've been speaking about in Sophia and understand essentially the power uh, of animal agriculture to unfortunately, to suppress our natural wisdom and capacities. And then we can also understand uh, from a, the, the, the fifth dimension of health, which is spirituality, it really has to do with our ethics, that as we begin to reconnect uh, with who we are, actually, and begin to uh, take time to be silent. And that, I think that's where the Zen aspect comes in uh, of questioning the official narratives, not only in the outer world, in our society, but questioning the official narratives within my own mind, the things that I have taken in myself to understand that in many ways, our minds have been colonized by a system that's not does not have our interests at heart. Just, just like a, a cow or pig or chicken is born uh, on, a, on a farm to be killed. There, that farmer does not have their best interest at heart. That farmer has, they're basically there to be killed and to be used as commodities. And they may get fed and so forth, but they're there to be killed and to be abused and to be exploited. So we have to understand that if we want to be free of being exploited, we have to stop exploiting other living beings. And that's why, uh, again, it's so fantastic to realize that the way it's set up, basically, is we do not need to eat animal foods to be healthy. I, I stopped eating all animal foods back in 1980. So that's 41 years ago. I have eaten no meat, dairy, eggs, anything since then. And I have to say, I'm not the only one. Uh, there's literally millions of people who are vegans and long-term vegans on this planet. And our health is just as good and probably a lot better than the typical 
people eating the, the standard meals, so lots of meat, dairy products, and eggs. So that's the wonderful good news uh, behind this whole thing is to realize that we've been given this gift. All of us have been given this wonderful gift of a physical body that does not require any animals to suffer to get all the nutrients that we need to thrive and celebrate our lives on this beautiful earth. We've been given that gift. The problem is the wound, the great wound that we've all suffered is that we've been born into a society where from the very first moments, uh, we were forced, uh, really without our permission, we were compelled to abandon that gift, to, just, to forget that we ever had that and to eat the flesh and secretions of horribly abused animals, cause them terrible suffering. And out of that violence, we continue to spin narratives of violence and behaviors of violence. And that as long as we keep eating animal foods, that's not gonna stop. No matter how we try to put a bandaid on this, try to create, you know, elect better uh, representatives and presidents and senators and have, uh, governmental uh, agencies that'll protect the environment. It never works. It doesn't work. They, everything gets captured by these forces of violence because we, the people, uh, essentially are the ones who are living in a world of mirrors. If we want the outer world to change, we have to change ourselves. We can't expect the outer world to get better if we don't get better. We have to get better. We have to, we have to wake up and stop being violent ourselves before we're ever going to find uh, that the outer world reflects that. And when we do wake up, we will find that the outer world will reflect that awakening. So this is what we're, this is the, uh, the situation that we're in right now. And I think, uh, again, we're, we're getting to the point now where it's essential that we understand clearly uh, the dynamics that are going on here. So I'm going to just, again, quickly um, do one other PowerPoint here. Uh, and um, let's see, it's, um, uh, oh, here we go. So this is the, um, this is the other, uh, the other one. And um, so, so just basically we see uh, the histor from the historical point of view, we've got uh, this thing that happened about 10,000 years ago, which is that at the very top we start here, animals were reduced. That's when we started herding animals. It was wild sheep about 10,000 years ago in what is today Iraq. And then, uh, then a little later, wild goats. And then about 2,000 years later, wild cows. And then pretty so there, people started herding animals. They started owning them as property. That's the beginning of herderism. I, a word I coined, which is really the core of our society today, is herderism. We herd animals. That's we don't we don't realize we're born into a herding society, but we are born into a herding society. That's that's what that's what we do. It's just instead of each of us, you know, with a stick going around herding an animal, uh, we have that. It, it's all done on a massive industrialized scale where we don't really see it. The animals are stuck away in these stinking sheds by the thousands or by the tens of thousands sometimes where they never see the light of day until they're taken out and killed. But we all support it with our dollars and so forth psychologically. So that herding started 10,000 years ago and they, and they started reducing uh, animals. Wildlife uh, was also reduced. They became pests. And so we had this separation from nature, uh, this whole trauma to animals began. That led to, went directly to a wealthy elite class of kings uh, so I used to teach college courses in these ancient texts. So the, and if you just read these ancient texts, like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Iliad, the Odyssey, the ancient Old Testament writings, you see that there's these kings. Uh, these are, this is uh, by the historic period, which was about 4,000 years ago. We have the first writings finally uh, emerging. And by that time, you can see there are these kings that dominate the society. They're wealthy and powerful for only one reason. That's because they own livestock. Livestock is what? Okay, you get to the third one, capital. Animals become wealth. The word capita, where we get our word capital and capitalism means head, as in head of sheep and goats and cows. And so these animals uh, became the foundation of wealth. The more cows and sheep and goats you had, the more wealth you had. That led directly, as I said earlier, to war. The oldest word for war on planet Earth that we know of is the ancient Sanskrit word gavya, 
It means war, it literally means the desire for more cows. That's the oldest word for war because these kings, when they wanted to uh, have more land and have more wealth, they would start attacking each other for their livestock. And that led directly to slavery because we, we never had human slavery until we had animal slavery. And whoever lost the war, typically in the, in the ancient days of these wars, when they started uh, over livestock, the animals became the property of the victors and then the human beings became the property of the victors. So, so uh, this idea of owning other beings as property, uh, it's a, and one of the things I've, I've learned, and this is very sobering, and we should all be very much aware of this, is that whatever we have done to animals, sooner or later, we have done it to each other, to other human beings. So now we see it, we see this happening, right? We see you know the forced medication of, of billions of animals that's been going on for decades, um, the imprisonment, the enslavement, uh, all of what we what we see happening to human beings, uh, we've been doing it to animals, microchipping, so forth. So we should not be doing this to animals if we don't want to have it done to us ourselves. And then uh, that led directly to the domination of the feminine, because essentially. <laughs> You can't have animal agriculture without imprisoning animals, right? That's what it is. That's the definition of it. you imprison them and you kill them. Those are the two things. But there's actually a third thing, uh, which is you have to rape them. You have to impregnate them against their will. And uh, the industries use what they refer to as a rape rack to do that. So the domination of the feminine is is absolutely endemic and, and part of animal agriculture. You can't have animal agriculture without the domination of the feminine. So when we go back earlier than 10,000 years, we go back to a time where animals are respected, where they're mysterious and powerful cohabitants of the earth with us, where women are respected for doing something men cannot do. But animal agriculture just rad radically reduces the status of animals. They become mere commodities that are bought and sold. And women, by the time the historic period emerged in these herding cultures were also bought and sold just like chattel property. They were seen merely as breeders to be used, just the way the men used the, the animals. They bred them uh, and they bred them to for larger animals. And so uh, they started breeding, uh, looking at, they wanted large women so their sons would be large and so forth. So this domination of the feminine uh, is part of animal agriculture. If you want to eat the animals, you want to have uh, fish sticks and French fries, uh, not French fries, but <laughs> uh, you know fried burgers. Um, this is gonna, this is, you can't avoid this. This is absolutely going to happen. You're gonna have the domination of the feminine and you're gonna have, again, the, the role model for boys uh, is the hard, tough, disconnected male uh, who has been forced to disconnect from his natural feelings of sensitivity and, and kindness and tenderness and gentleness and, and respect. Because you can't do, you can't, you have to have men who are hard and tough and capable of violence towards animals and towards rival herders and towards women if you're gonna have animal agriculture. So this is the system that we're born into. It goes back 10,000 years, which is not that long, but in this 10,000 years, we have managed to uh, unfortunately destroy most of the earth uh, as we can see and uh, led to the, the massive deforestation, the complete destruction of the oceans. Uh, and uh, we're seeing right now the body of the earth and the bodies of our children being polluted and harmed in many ways. But the thing is to understand is that it's absolutely not uh, essential because we have here, for example, uh, vegan living, uh, a, a way of ahimsa. Uh, ahimsa is the old Sanskrit word that means nonviolence. L O W F P B. That's a local, organic, whole food, plant based way of eating and living. If we go local, if we go organic, if we go whole foods, this is these are the main keys. Local because it takes a lot less energy. The more we grow our food ourselves, the more we support local farmers, the more we create. Uh, communities and ecologies of resilience right where we are, the more empowered we are and the more we help build communities of sustainability. Organic is essential because herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, genetically engineered foods are devastating to ecosystems, to our health. I mean, it's not an option. Uh, we, we, organic is absolutely essential. It's not vegan if it's not organic. And then whole foods is essential because as soon as we start using uh, preservatives and artificial colorings and flavorings, as soon as we start that down that road, 
uh, we're getting away from health. So the mo so we should really be eating whole foods, whole grains, whole uh, legumes, fruits, vegetables, sprouts, and so forth. Uh, and then plant-based is critical. As soon as it comes from an animal, we have waste, misery, violence, and destruction. So it's not difficult to eat this way. It takes some, some learning and some practice, and we can maybe talk about ways to do that, but it's very much possible. My wonderful spouse, Madeline, and I, I mean, we, we just <laughs> were so happy uh, that we discovered this. I mean, that's the great thing. It's like the tremendous liberation uh, of eating in this way and, and knowing that the ripples that radiate from our lives are not causing violence and misery and toxicity in the world, but we're doing our best to, to spread loving kindness and compassion and health to other living beings. And of course, that's what comes back to us. So we see that there's a, a, a basically a benevolent kind of a spiral instead of a, a creating a, 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 a downward spiral, which animal agriculture does of increasing violence and war and misery and toxicity and injustice. That's what animal agriculture does. And you can't escape from it. I mean, there's no, there's no way if you're going to eat animal foods, you're going to go straight straight into hell, the, the very hell that we that we inflict on cows and pigs and chickens, we create for ourselves. But it's not, it's absolutely, we can stop it, each one of us. We understand uh, the natural abundance of the earth, the natural healthier ecosystems, the healthier economies, healthier people, healthier uh, uh, government, freedom, justice, and equality, harmony, and peace. These all go together and they come out of a mentality of ahimsa and of kindness and respect for other beings, not just theorizing about it, but actually practicing it. So that's the key to remember, I think, that fundamental key. So this kind of uh, shows the, the basic idea that, that uh, essentially uh, we have, um, I don't know if you can see that, <laughs> nobody wants to acknowledge the cow in the room, which is animal agriculture, and we see these different, you know, diabetes, the rainforests are getting destroyed, global warming, all these different things, 800 million people are starving, California's running out of water, angioplasties, violent societies, the pandemics, dead zones, all these things basically come pouring forth, we have to understand with clarity how these are, are interconnected and understand essentially that these animals, these beautiful beings, at least some of Madeline's paintings, this is really what we're designed to eat. These are the kinds of foods that we naturally salivate about and we are designed for. And we, when we see the, a picture of of Fiona, this is a pig, Fiona, who escaped from an animal from a barbecue in upstate New York and ended up in an animal sanctuary. Um, these beings, we don't salivate when we see these naturally. We we're not designed to be eating these animals. We know that these are beings who, when we look into their eyes, we see that there's someone there. And uh, when we, our health really depends on letting them be healthy, letting letting them have healthy ecosystems and letting them live their lives the way they're designed to, that when we allow them to live their lives, then we will remember how we can live our lives, that these are the beings, really, we are interconnected with them. And uh, we owe it really to our children and to the children of these living beings to let them celebrate their lives. And as we do that, then we'll be free to celebrate our lives. If we fail to do that, if we allow our minds to be colonized, if we don't heal the wound of animal agriculture in our own body, speech, and mind, and in our relationships, uh, you can see the, the earth will be burned up. These animals, like this little koala, is hanging on to the earth, the same earth that we're hanging on to. And the beauty of life here is so spectacular to realize this, to remember this, to have a heart for these little beings who are nestled in nature and, a, and to stop cutting down and destroying and burning their habitats, to graze cows, to, to, to kill uh, completely unnecessarily, to realize that th there's a beauty and interconnectedness of life that is uh, spectacular. So uh, all these beings are interconnected and they're really uh, families together here. So I'd like to um, uh, just talk a little bit more about actual uh, positive things we can we can do uh, to help uh, us to as individuals uh, broaden our awareness and our understanding of how we can live our lives and then uh, and then open it up for some questions so um, this the 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 part so far has been about 
um, our society and the history of how we got here and how animal agriculture is the Trojan horse and how the five dimensions of health are all interconnected and how animal agriculture uh, undermines that, but plant-based, whole, a whole food, organic, plant-based way of eating uh, naturally engenders uh, health on all five dimensions. And that's so important to understand that. And each one of us, I think, you know, we all have our own story of how we have been able to awaken out of, uh, to whatever degree we have, uh, the cultural narratives. I think uh, awakening out of cultural narratives is the most important thing we can do. Uh, when you have a narrative that is so filled with uh, untruth and lies and deception and violence, we have to literally get it out of us. We, that's essential to do. I remember like in my own life when I was a little kid, uh, born and raised in Concord, Massachusetts back in the 1950s, uh, I ate a lot of meat, dairy, and eggs. I was growing up, that's what we all ate. I was the oldest child. I, you know, I, I just went along with it. And I remember uh, at one point, I asked my mother, I was about seven, I said, Mom, the kind of foods we're eating, is this what everybody eats? And my mother said, yeah, it's pretty much what everybody eats. And then she left, and then she came back, and she said, I'm sorry, that's not totally true. I was thinking about it, you know, there are, actually, there are people, they're called vegetarians. And I was like, what? What's a vegetarian? I never heard that word in my life. And I was at that age when I liked learning new words, like long words, a vegetarian. That's a kind of <laughs> neat word. What's that, mom? And my mother thought about it for a minute. And then she said, well, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. You're never going to meet one. And uh, she was right. You know, I never met one. She said, I don't know where they get their protein. And so um, I had this image in my young mind of very rare people, because my mother, who to me was so old, she had never even met one. My gosh, they must be so rare. And she said they didn't get enough protein. So to me, that meant, wow, they must really be very weak, miserable, unhappy, you know, skinny people. And I was so glad I wasn't a vegetarian. That was the last thing in the world I wanted to be was a vegetarian. And my mother was totally right. I never heard the word again. Uh, I remember going away to a summer camp in Vermont when I was about 13 that was affiliated with this dairy, one of these beautiful little organic dairies nestled in the green mountains of Vermont where nothing bad ever happens. It's all good. All right. I mean, this is what, we, this is what we're told. But my goodness, I mean, I remember learning when I was at this uh, summer camp how to catch my own chicken and how to hold her down with one hand, have my axe in the other hand and cut her head off and put her through the scalding tank. We all ate our chickens like, and I have to say, you know, from, for me at that point, it was not that hard to do. I mean, I had gone through at that point, I was 13 years old. I'd gone through 13 years at that point of the most intense Indoct cultural indoctrination you can go through, right? 13 years, three times a day, I was eating meals where the subtext was, you know, God gave us these animals to eat. You have to eat them or you're going to die within 24 hours of a protein deficiency. You know, this is it. This is no, there's no option. There's no alternative. Everybody I knew, everybody did it. You know, I'm going to go along, you know, the whole thing of just going along to get along, right? Just do what everybody does. I mean, as a kid, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't question that. I had no, I had no example. I had no way to question that. So I killed my chicken and I was, you know, a guy's got to do what a guy's got to do. You know, the, the size coming of age, I was getting big and strong and I can do that. No problem. And then we would gather every year, we gathered around a dairy cow and we did the same thing. We put a gun to her poor head and we kill her. And if the guy would say, well, we can't use it for milk anymore. We're going to use it for meat. And this happens on every dairy, organic or not. When these cows get to be only five years old, even though they would naturally live to be 25 years old, when they're 20, when they're five years old, uh, they're already worn out because they've been kept pregnant and lactating simultaneously, which breaks down the health of any female mammal very quickly. There no female mammal is designed to be pregnant and lactating simultaneously over and over and over again, but that's what they do on any dairy and uh, organic or not. So don't, don't ever think there's any such thing as compassionate milk. You have to kill the babies. You have to kill the mothers. You have to kill everybody. It's, it's a killing machine. It's a rape and kill operation. So I saw that. We killed them. We ate them. But I still, I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that this wasn't the right thing to do. And the good thing was uh, when I was in college, I, I, back in the early 1970s, I heard there were a few vegetarians around. I didn't actually meet them, but I heard there were some somewhere. Uh, and then right after college, my brother and I, uh, my younger brother, Ed, and I decided to leave home. And we thought we would walk all the way to California uh, from Concord, Massachusetts. And so we headed off walking. And after about a month, we got as far as Buffalo. 
And I remember thinking, gosh, you know, it's cold. It was October. So we headed south. We actually walked all the way to Alabama. And on this long walk uh, over many months, we stopped for a while uh, in Tennessee at a community called The Farm. And The Farm in 1975, when we got there, was the largest hippie commune in the world. And it was about um, 900 people, and they were all vegetarians. And uh, there they were. And they were actually vegans. I mean, no one heard of the word vegan back in 1975. So you couldn't say they were vegans. No one knew the word. But they said, we're vegetarians. But they didn't need any meat or dairy or eggs. And they did it for ethical reasons. They did it for two main reasons. I asked the guy, you know, he was telling me about everything. And I said, so why are you vegetarian? And he said, well, there's two main reasons. One is most of the food we're growing, we're feeding to animals while people are starving. So we're eating lower on the food chain. So there'll be enough for everyone to eat, you know, to, to help world hunger. And I thought, well, that's beautiful. That's a noble thing. Why doesn't everybody do that? I, I wondered, why didn't I hear about that before in college and so forth? And that was number one. And then number two, he said, do you know what these animals go through? And he explained a little bit about the hyper confinement of animals and all the abuse. And so I thought, oh, my gosh, it's such a, such a terrible thing we're doing to these animals. But the beautiful thing was that I was sitting with them every day for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And these big hippie, you can imagine <laughs> these big, uh, gigantic pots of of um, uh, uh, like soy, it was like soybeans <laughs> on the wood burning stove with some vegetables. It was like really primitive, but it was like hippie food. It was all V, it was all vegan. It was, it was grains and vegetables and rice. And so that was it from that day, actually, when I talked to that guy back in 1975, I've never eaten any meat in my life. And it was so neat when many years later, when I met Madeline in Switzerland and we started comparing notes and I found out that she the same month and year in 1975 also decided to never eat meat again in her life as well. And, and then a few years later, she came over and, and uh, we've been married for so, so many years now. But um, the, the, the power, I think, for that actually for me was uh, realizing I didn't need to eat meat. And then a few years later, 1980, I got it about dairy and eggs. So I became a vegan in 1980. And then a few years after that, like I said earlier, uh, I decided to shave my head and become a Zen Buddhist monk. I was living in uh, these meditation centers in California. I got out to California eventually. I was living in a Tibetan Buddhist center and then a Zen uh, center. And, I, and uh, so I was living in this Zen monastery in South Korea. And like I said earlier, I realized that the, these people were practicing Shojin, which essentially is the ancient uh, Asian uh, teaching of, of not eating any animal foods for spiritual reasons, for spiritual awakening. And so uh, the monastery was a totally vegan monastery. They've been practicing that for seven or 800 years. And so that, that experience of, of being a Zen Buddhist monk and meditating every day from like three o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night, uh, just a, a very intensive in, in silence, just, in, just going along uh, to, to deepen my understanding of my true nature. That was really the key. Uh, that I realized that my mind had been colonized, that all of my thoughts, my even my impression, my ideas of who I am, all of that, uh, it's like time to question everything and get to a deeper understanding of what it is that we actually are. And I think if we can quiet our minds enough, and this is what I discovered, if we quiet our minds enough, we can directly realize our true nature, that what we are was never born and will never die. That what we are is infinite love that is there to grow and contribute and to awaken to the truth and to bless others. That's our purpose, to find our unique way to be a blessing to others and to help each other. And so for me, um, the whole idea here is to realize that veganism is not an option. It's not like, oh, I could do it or not. It, just realizing it, it's nothing to be proud of. It's just simply our true nature. Our natural tendency when we see a being is to see a being. And when we see a being, we naturally have a sense of respect for, uh, for this being. And so all of us uh, have been born into a culture where we've been forced to put on a mask, right? We've been forced to put on a mask, to put on a fake persona, to actually uh, cover up uh, who we are and to cover up who others are and who animals are. And we don't see beings as they are. Uh, all we see is masks. All we see is a delusion. And so the idea is to take off the mask on ourselves, to see our true face. That's what they say in Zen, to discover your true face, to see your face before you were born, 
not your physical body, who you actually are, what we actually are. It's beautiful if we could actually see it. It's beyond beautiful. I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> what can I say? Anyway, it's, uh, it's uh, liberation. And so the idea is that compassion and kindness and caring for other living beings is our true nature. And it is, these things have been stolen from us by being raised in a society of delusion, of, of being raised eating animal-based foods where, it's, where that is part of the narrative, that we're superior and they're inferior. And all the social justice uh, problems that we've had uh, come out of animal agriculture, come out of this fundamental delusion of seeing myself as a fundamentally separate self here to try to get what I can and keep away uh, what I don't want and compete with others to do that. We create what in Buddhism is called samsara, which means suffering that will never end in this life or the next or the next or the next or the next. It'll never end until we at some point awaken out of this delusion. So um, this is what real health is. Real health is fundamentally spiritual health. When we understand authentically our true nature and we see beings as beings, then we set into motion a cascading effect of benevolent actions, of healing actions, of awakening actions in our own life where we begin to liberate others. We never take out our wallet and pay for animal-based foods. We do our best to minimize our consumption. We delight in a minimalist lifestyle. I mean, really delight in a minimalist lifestyle. I love, we live, not, my wife and I lived in an RV, you know, like less than 200 square feet for, for um, 18 years. And if I wanted a new pair of pants, I had to give away a pair of pants. I, I, you know, I, I, I just absolutely savored that, that way of living. It's so wonderful. You know, the more things we have, the more in prison we are. To actually minimize consumption, to consume with respect, to, to eat as low on the food chain as possible, and to look at every arising in nature, all the trees and flowers and animals, to let them live their lives and to not exploit them is the greatest joy. The whole idea in any spiritual tradition is you give up a lower happiness to attain a higher happiness. People say, oh, but I love the taste of, of hamburgers or I love the taste of the cheese or something. I mean, you give up that, that lower pleasure and you'll get a much, much, much higher pleasure. The pleasure, the joy of liberation, the joy of radiant health, the joy of a heart that is open to the beauty of life all around. You know, the thing is, the reason spiritual health is so important is that that is where we, that's what makes our heart beat. That's where we get our inspira the inspiration for all of the cells in, in, our, in, our, in our body. Right. I mean, if if I'm living a life where I'm not living my dharma, my dream, my purpose, then I get up in the morning and I'm thinking, oh, I got to go to work to make some money. And so my, my every cell in my body is going like, so why the heck am I doing all this for this guy? You know, he's just he's just going to work to make some money. He's not even appreciating you know his life. Why, why, why don't I just go on strike? I mean, what, what's the point here? Why should I keep beating this heart? And why should I keep doing this? We're just sending death signals to uh, subconsciously to our body. And so our back, so bacteria, bacteria are not our enemies. Bacteria are our friends. But if we're, if we're not living our life, then our bacteria naturally start to break our body down. If we're eating animal foods, of course, they're trying to get rid of all the toxins, but they begin to take us apart because we're not, we're not alive. If we're alive, we do not have to worry about, about microbes and we don't have to worry about a healthy immune system. We'll have a healthy immune system because we don't have anything to be immune to, right? I mean, we're, we're one with nature. We are one with nature. We're not separate from nature. This whole idea that we are somehow separate from nature and that nature is going to harm us, that there's all these invisible things that are going to harm us, these microbes, these viruses and bacteria. I mean, think of it. We are the viruses and, and, and bacteria to cows and pigs and chickens. We are that, right? I mean, these cows and pigs and chickens are attacked by invisible forces. They can't see. If I go, to an, if I go into 
a, um, a store, take out my wallet and pay for a hamburger or pay for fish sticks or pay for cheese, I'm like a virus. Because of me, I'm an invisible being, but because of my action, the, the cow or the pig or the fish is being horribly abused, killed. And so now we are in the same position. We are terrified as a society of these invisible beings that are attacking us. I mean, it's so poetic. So we have to realize that what we are is essentially radiantly healthy and come from that state of knowing the truth that we're not uh, separate from nature and that we're not a physical body anyway. What we are is life itself. And once we begin to understand this, uh, uh, not just intellectually, but um, in our feelings, then we begin to live our life as an expression of this. So on every level coming down from that, uh, emotionally, our choices of food, we see that the, how it all lines up with as we eat more organic foods, we're supporting healthy ecosystems. As we eat totally plant-based foods, we find that every nutrient that we need to be healthy is you know, all the vitamins, minerals, all of the um, amino acids and fiber and all the essential fatty acids, everything that we need comes from plants. Nothing comes from an animal. There's nothing coming from an animal. In fact, uh, people in the United States, we eat more meat, as I was saying earlier, than any other society. If everyone in the world ate the way we ate, according to scientists who study this kind of thing, it would take another at least two or three or four Earths to feed everyone. So why are we in America, in the United States, exporting uh, McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King and so forth to other uh, cultures when that would destroy if everybody ate that way? And we saw it when we were in Africa. I mean, it was very clear to us because in Africa, um, there's still, there has been a very diverse wildlife. Unlike say here in the United States or Europe, there's all these giraffes and I mean, all kinds of animals, you know, celebrating their lives. But we could see when we were there, how under attack that is, how vulnerable the, the population of lions and elephants and gorillas and all these, all these native free living animals. Because why? Because they're starting to introduce Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King and McDonald's into Africa. And now uh, they have these huge, uh, fields of corn and soy genetically engineered, you know, being paid for by the World Bank and the IMF. And, you know, we have this whole, I call it the military industrial meat medical pharmaceutical media banking complex, which just spreads its tentacles throughout the earth. And, and now in Africa, the, the lions are becoming the enemies, the elephants are becoming the enemies, the giraffes are becoming the enemies, the farmers are killing off all these animals, just like they've done here. And they're going to go extinct if, if we keep going this way. And if these, all these other animals go extinct, we'll go extinct. I mean, we're, we're part of all this life. So it's essential that we understand the situation here uh, and to um, do the best we can to question the official narratives in our society, all of them that lead to this kind of violence and to create uh, alternatives, to create communities uh, of sustainability, vegan restaurants, vegan meetup groups, online groups, whatever we can to help share this message and to question the fear and violence and domination and exploitation that the mainstream media is um, purveying uh, so violently and so pr prolifically actually through the pharmaceutical industry and the big fast food industries, the chemical industries, the petroleum industries, all these industries make a lot, most of their money really, or all of their money through animal agriculture. So uh, to create uh, new uh, e economies uh, based on health and compassion and sustainability, that's really, I think, the key. But it starts with each one of us as an individual making an effort to understand these dynamics at a deep level and then to bring our own lives into alignment with this. And bringing our own lives into alignment, I think I wanted to say just a couple more words and I'm going to open it up for questions. I can see it's just about time. I'm supposed to to do that at 12.30, my time in, in California. So um, that's in five minutes. So just the last couple of minutes, I'll just say, uh, before I open it up for whatever questions or comments you may have, I just like to say that um, the, Zen, the Zen part of this, uh, again, uh, it really has to do with cultivating our mind and inner purification. You know, the, the idea is that 
um, toxins, we can see it very clearly in food that when we eat foods that are toxic, uh, our body it becomes sick. You know, most, most all illness is actually our body cleansing. And the same thing is true when I'm eating uh, in other ways, right? How do we eat? How do we feed ourselves? We feed ourselves with food. We feed ourselves with air. So make sure the air we're breathing is clean as best we can. You know, we, we should have air purifiers if we need to, whatever it is. Water, we eat water, right? So make sure the water, so much water is polluted nowadays. Uh, what else do we eat? We eat relationships. You know, I, I think one of the main ways people uh, are unhealthy is because the relationships that they're in are stressful or the relationships are antagonistic uh, at work or in their family, whatever it is. So to really live our lives so that we take responsibility for the quality of our relationships, that we're being a, a force for kindness and love and understanding to other people around us. And so that we're being forgiving and caring for other people so that our relationships are harmonious, that we're understanding. This is a, a work of, this is an inner work, but also a work in the world. Uh, a cons we, are, we consume relationships. We consume uh, also uh, books and, and media, right? Media is a huge thing. What kind of media are we consuming? Are we, really, this is so important. Uh, we follow, you know, people say, well, I follow the news. What does that mean? Following the news could very well mean I just allow myself to be completely brainwashed and brain poisoned and programmed by a bunch of toxic lies. That's what it means. So uh, to take responsibility for the quality of the media we're consuming and be aware of that. And then another thing we consume is nature. Are we actually getting out into nature? Are we, eat, are we eating with our eyes and with our senses? And are we partaking of water and air and landscapes and forests and trees and appreciating the beauty of nature around us? There's so many keys to being radiantly healthy. Most of it has to do, a lot of it has to do with food, but a lot of it has to do with non-food things. That's why you can't say, well, if someone's vegan, they're going to always be healthy. First of all, a lot of vegan food isn't even healthy if it has, if it's processed. But even if it's healthy vegan food, if if our relationships are, are toxic, if we're not living our purpose, if we're not being creative, uh, if we're not getting exercise, if we're not getting fresh air, I mean, there's so many aspects of living our lives in a healthy way that are non-food related. And meditation is critically important from my, from my point of view. I mean, meditation, not in a narrow sense, you have to be in the full lotus sitting on the floor and something like that, but just to be, take time every day to be present and to simply listen. And maybe I'll close in the last minute here. I'll just, um, I happen to be sitting here uh, at a piano, so. I like playing the piano because no one can argue with a D minor chord. beings be happy, may all beings be free, may all beings be at peace. So thank you all so much for your kind and loving attention. And I'll be happy to open it up now for any questions you may have. Well, thank you. This has been 
incredibly enlightening for all of us. Nobody can argue with a D minor chord. How profound. <laughs> um, thank you from the bottom of all of our hearts. I, I, feel, I feel a collective uh, togetherness right now. And so with that, yes, we're gonna open it up for questions and just wanna make sure that everybody knows um, we're unable to take questions directly from the chat box. So if anybody has questions, what we want you to do now is go to the bottom of your screens, your Zoom screens, you'll see a number of different tabs and you can click on your reactions tab. And by doing so, a little raise hand button comes up. You click that raise hand button. We will see your raised hand and we'll make sure we take your questions in the order in which we receive them. I'm starting to see a few come in now. That's great. And once uh, we'll go ahead and ask each of you by name to uh, uh, unmute yourselves and we'll have you ask Will a, a direct question. If you can keep it relatively brief, we'd like to keep enough room for everybody. So Will, thanks again. And we'll, we'll start off with our first question. Um, I really uh, hope I am pronouncing your name correctly. And if you will join us now, uh, Joya, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself and, and we'd love to hear your question for Will. Yes, you pronounced it right. Thank you. I've been a vegan uh, for about 30 years. And I just wanted to hear you what you felt about these impossible burgers and the different kind of veganism uh, processed foods that are out there. I feel concerned that I do not want the veganism movement to be harmed by these movements because I feel like, you know, eating fresh foods. And, and so I wanted just to hear you talk about that. Okay, thank you, Joya. That's a really important question because this is really, <laughs> it's growing so fast. Um, I think, you know, basically, uh, it's a good idea, I think, to try to uh, encourage people who are not vegan to become vegan by offering them uh, foods that help them to transition. So uh, and I went vegan 40 years ago when uh, the soy milk was disgusting. All you could do is buy powder and mix it with water. And, you know, I was like, oh, man, it was really terrible. And the, the first, I, I mean, we made the first soy ice cream actually ever. First, I, first vegan ice cream at the farm. Uh, it was called, we called it ice bean made out of soy, soybeans. And uh, it was terrible. But, you know, <laughs> well, better than nothing, you know. And uh, so it's, it's been great and unlevel to see over the last 40 years how, um, the, the ice cream, the vegan ice cream is better than, you know, the non-vegan ice cream. And there's now vegan cheeses and vegan butters and vegan burgers and vegan, all kinds of stuff. It, the technology is improving a lot to make it more palatable and more delicious, I guess, for people who have the Western palate. So it makes it easier, I think, for people to go vegan. And then hopefully, to me, it's kind of like a two-stage process. If you can get people in the door, uh, and say, well, the vegan burgers are delicious, you know, try it out. And, and then maybe at that point, they're more open to hearing some of the things I was talking about here today about the violence towards animals, the environmental devastation, and, and, and so forth. And they don't just stop there, they keep going and, and stop buying, like, I don't ever buy processed food. Um, but, but I sometimes, you know, will, will, will tell someone, you know, try a, I never, I actually never encourage the impossible burger because that particular one, uh, I think is too, too processed. I mean, it's got GMO uh, stuff in there. So I, I'm not, I'm not I, I don't ever recommend that one, but I, I think like, for example, tempeh burgers or some burgers, there's some that are less processed, sun burgers made just from sunflower seeds. Uh, that I would be more likely to recommend to people. And, uh, but I think your concern is really important because there's also this whole idea of lab grown meat, which is keeps rearing its head. And a lot of people think it's a great idea because uh, people are gonna eat meat anyway. But again, I think uh, already we're at the point now where we have Beyond Burgers, for example, and other ones that are so similar to meat that a lot of even experts can't tell the difference. And so if people can't tell the difference already, uh, what's the point? I mean, why do we have to actually have meat? Because I think essentially the idea of eating meat, uh, the flesh of an animal, if it's lab grown or not, it's like, well, we don't need to eat. We're not meat eaters. We don't need to. So so I would real I, I personally don't uh, recommend those things. If somebody wants to, you know, it, it's fine. fine. It's, that's their choice. But I think uh, what I recommend is a whole food, organic, plant-based way of eating. 
And then if people on their own want to say, well, I, you know, I like these processed, you know, uh, vegan foods. Uh, it, the problem is that very often it, they, they're not that healthy because these processed vegan foods very often, uh, you know, make people, they have a lot of toxins and toxins are really what make us sick. And so if, we're vegan and eating processed foods and we're not healthy, that's not a good example for other people. So that's one of the things I love about eating the food. I just eat whatever Madeline gives me because I know she's, <laughs> she's Miss Organic and it's going to be organic. It's going to be whole. And she, you know, and, and it's been great. You know, I mean, I have, haven't, neither one of us have been to a doctor or even to the pharmacy in like 40 years. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a really wonderful foundation for health. And I think, uh, there, there, we don't have to give up our health to to care for animals. I mean, it actually uh, works together. So, avoiding processed foods, from my point of view, is is really important. And um, we now have a food forest here. We're grow. We have we've planted about seventy fruit and nut trees here in Northern California. A lot of the food we're eating, we just grow on our own land. It's only half an acre, but you can grow a lot of food in a small area if you really put your mind to it. And, and put some time and energy into it. And I think it's more important than ever that we start to grow our own food and to start to see growing our own food as a very noble endeavor. It's a wonderful thing. Or to support people who are doing that. You know, there's this idea that growing food, being a farmer, that's kind of like a low, like a low caste job. And it's, it shouldn't be. It should be the highest, I think, in many ways. Growing healthy food that's unprocessed, that's organic, that's in harmony with nature, that's probably one of the highest callings of a human being, really, to create uh, context for healthy food. Um, it's a wonderful thing. So I think it's very important to keep that alive in our movement as much as we can. Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks, Joya. Well, thank you. Um, actually, that's all we have by way of questions. I just wanna ask if there's okay. anything else that you'd like to share specifically uh, perhaps you haven't covered at this point. Yeah, well, there's a lot. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I think that, you know, the thing to understand in all of this, really, when we talk about like what, what Joya was bringing up, um, when, we, when we think about the, the journey that we we're all called to take, uh, it's always a journey, essentially, uh, that's unique. And each one of us has our own unique path. So, uh, a lot of people ask me, I mean, I get asked all the time things like, what do I say to people when they say that uh, plants have feelings too? Or what do I say to people when they say that Jesus ate meat? Or what do I say to people when they say, well, God, you know, dogs and cats eat meat and lions eat meat. And, you know, why shouldn't we eat meat? Aren't we, aren't we as good as them? And, you know, there's, all, there's so many um, questions I think that people have that have to do with how we can actually be effective vegan advocates. A lot, you know, a lot of times we think that um, we we should try to change other people. You know, and I and I and I, I know what that's like. I I was when I was an er, vegan in the, for the first probably ten years, I was always trying to change other people. I was trying to get them to go vegan. I'm still trying to get them to go vegan in a sense, but but I realized that the dynamic of trying to change somebody uh, creates. Uh, a, a certain hostility, basically. It's kind of like if someone came at me trying to change me, you know, I'd, I'd have my, I'd have my fists up, you know, <laughs> I'd say, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, that's a, it's a healthy thing to, to defend yourself from someone trying to change you. you know, it's a natural thing. So as vegans, we think we're right and we have the answer and we want everyone to become like us, right? So we want to go out and change people and we want to shake them. I wanted to shake people until they went vegan when I was first started because I knew it was right. And I want to just get everybody to go vegan because we're, we're going to destroy our planet if we don't do it. So, uh, but the problem is that they fight back and we don't make much progress, really. We create a lot of burned out and we, get, we don't want to talk about it anymore. So that, that's kind of the, um, I talk about these stages of veganism. You know, the first stage of veganism is just the, the beginning stage, which is really hard because we have so much to learn. You know, what do we eat and what do we say to people and what do we do with the company barbecue? What do we do with Thanksgiving? You know, all this learning to do. Then when we get through that stage, usually the second stage is the angry vegan stage. And now we're like, oh, we're angry all the time because uh, people don't listen to us. They say, I love bacon anyway. And so we're trying to change them and, and we get frustrated. And then we, we, some people avoid that by the, what I call the closet vegan stage where we just don't want to talk about it at all to anybody and just leave me alone and let me eat my 
raw carrots and tofu or <laughs> whatever. But, um, but there is the third stage. Um, and I think when we can, we can reach that third stage of deep veganism where uh, we understand the, the wounding that's gone on. We understand the history of this. We understand the things I've been talking about here today. And we understand essentially that we can't change another person. Is it one person I can change? It's this one. I can change myself and I can become a more um, embodied manifestation of veganism. What is veganism? What is it? Veganism is love. Veganism is love. It's loving kindness and compassion and caring and justice and freedom and equality and sensitivity and joy and abundance. I mean, that's what veganism is. So to manifest my life in that way, that's a big job. That's a lot of work in a sense, a lot of uh, changes that I can make in my own relationship with the people in my life. So I think if the vegan movement and as the vegan movement begins to mature to the point, uh, and, the, and I mean this really for the health movement in general, but especially the plant-based vegan movement, that we are here to become the best people we can be and, and focus on that primarily to really live what veganism is as kindness and respect and the nitty gritty of daily life of my relationships with my, the people around me and how I'm living my life and how, how I'm making my living and all those things that then when we bring that being that we are to our activism and to our, our relationships with other people that will be much more effective essentially because we won't be trying to change people the irony is this the more i try to change other people the more they resist and the less i can change anybody the more i don't try to change other people and just work on changing myself the more the people around me just start changing <laughs> it was, you know it's like we don't have to make it happen it's not I, we just have to live this and then speak our own truth. That's what Gandhi emphasized. You know, he said, be the change you want to see in the world. And he also talked a lot about satyagraha. Satyagraha is an old Sanskrit word. It means the power of truth. Satya means truth, truth power. So if we speak our own truth with love, then we're creating a context for other people to hear that. And I think the main truth, the number one truth is this, because this is what we all share. And it's this idea, which is, uh, to share my own truth, and this is it. I'm so happy, you know, so be positive. I'm so happy that, the, that I realized that the only reason I was eating animal foods all those years that I did was because I was just following orders. I'm not doing it anymore, and it's great. And then stop there, don't say anything else. You know, just, just very simple. Just two basic thoughts. You know, I'm, happiness, number one, I'm very happy that I discovered, number two, that I was eating animal foods because I was following orders. That's true for everyone. There's no one doing it for that. When I say that, I'm glad I realized I was just uh, following orders and eating animal foods and it wasn't a big deal, so I'm not doing it anymore and it's great. Other people at a deep level are gonna relate to that and they'll say, hmm, yeah, that's the only reason I'm eating animal foods too. And so we've just planted a seed. See, the idea is we can't change other people, but we can plant seeds and we can plant them either ineffectively or effectively. And the most effective way, I think, is with love and respect and by telling our own story without trying to change them. And when we just plant our seed with a pure heart and with, with uh, the highest, uh, you know, the highest uh, wish for the other person, then it goes in deep and then their own wisdom and their own compassion will begin to water the seeds that you planted and that little sprout you planted, that little seed will sprout and it'll grow and in a few weeks or months, whatever, they'll go vegan. And if you do it really well, they will forget that what you said. They won't even, they won't even thank you. If you really do it well, they won't even thank you. They'll, they won't even know. <laughs> but that's okay. You know, the whole idea is to just plant the seeds. You can be like Johnny Appleseed and plant the seeds, speak your truth with love to other people, how great it is, how wonderful, how liberating it is to liberate animals, we'll, how liberating it is to eat lower on the food chain, to uh, the, the health that we have, and just plant those seeds. And then as we do that as a movement, I think we'll find, and that's why I love so many of the speakers on this, uh, I know in the Real Truth About Health Conference, are aware of these ideas and are embodying this. And I've, I've seen this over the years with this conference. It's really a very um, beautiful energy of, of sharing, of giving, of, um, of just speaking our truth. 
and then letting that reverberate. And so ultimately it comes back to the basic fact that each one of us is only on this earth for a few short decades. We're just here for a, just a, a few minutes. It goes by so quickly. I, I can't believe it. I'm already in my late sixties and I, it's like, where did the time go? So the, the whole idea is to just use every day, to give thanks for every day and to just use every day as best we can to be a voice for those who don't have a voice and to um, be a force for healing and to be part of the solutions to the problems rather than just being part of the problem here. So it looks like there's maybe another hand up. So I'll go ahead and pass it back. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate and, and thank you for all of that. that. That was amazing. And and yes, we have a couple of hands that have come up. So uh, with that, uh, Bruce, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself, we'd love to have you ask your question for Will. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Will, for uh, sacrificing and to uh, continual understanding the earth and the universe around you for all these years. Um, it's quite a operation to keep understanding and wisdom uh, forefront in your life. And uh, congratulations on that. There are very few people who do that. Uh, my question is, um, uh, I wonder, I actually was brought, brought up near you when you say Concord, Massachusetts, and I was uh, in Somerset, Massachusetts, not too far from you, and about the same age. But it seems like you diverted uh, your life into uh, at some point in uh, uh, Eastern thought um, and travel the roads um, and uh, uh, in that avenue to find a very lyrical and uh, pastoral life, uh, especially through Zen. And um, I myself uh, went to the universities near, nearby where you were and uh, I was fortunate enough to um, have a mentor who studied Western philosophy. And um, so my route to uh, understanding and wisdom came through Western uh, philosophy and understanding. And uh, although it lacks the lyrical and pastoral um, uh, love that, that, that one gets from the Eastern world, um, I too I think that I have come to uh, a certain wisdom uh, through a Western thought and um, it's more scientific and more analytical and, um, and sometimes harsh. Uh, but um, my question is, uh, uh, I don't understand why more people haven't found truth through um, reason and logic and to be able to stay fast to the, um, uh, some of the um, uh, early philosophers in the West which was, were mingling with uh, the East somewhat, but uh, in the Greeks, and to be able to find truth and logic and, and everything about uh, food, um, what we talk uh, in this conference, especially, uh, is about uh, scientific, scientific thought, which was brought by Aristotle and, uh, you know, some of his followers. And, um, we saw have to, uh, many people like yourself have to divert. And I studied in the Tao temple for a number of years, but much later in life. But um, why is it that we have to get away from logic and um, reason in order to uh, sort of, for you to find truth and uh, in a meditative life, whereas uh, as even though as, it's not as pastoral. Uh, truth is truth. And um, I, yeah, do I do think one last thing. I uh -huh. do think through, through, through proof, through understanding, through reason, we can find uh, all the things that you said. Yeah, that's a really good. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, that's a great question. And um, I, yeah, I love that. You know, the thing is, of course, is that uh, we have these two capacities within us. We have the capacity for intuition, uh, sort of non-rational or trans-rational knowing, and we have the capacity for rational thought as well. And I think they're both 
extremely valuable and they support each other. They should, should support each other. Um, the problem, of course, is that we human beings are not rational. I mean, if we, if we were not, we're not really, uh, we're raised in a society that's not rational and we're not t- taught to be rational or reasonable. If we were really rational and reasonable, everybody would already be vegan. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's completely uh, such an obvious thing. And so uh, on every level, so, so uh, in many ways we're tribal, we, 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 we want to get along, we want to conform, we want to be like other people around us, that's probably the main drive, and we, resp- and we, and we want to follow the leader, whoever the leader is. And, so, and then we're living in a society, of course, where uh, science has been captured in many ways by uh, money. And so we have now, uh, and the media has been captured by money and education has been captured also. So, uh, so everything's been corrupted. So I think uh, we can, either way will get us there. Either if you have a piercing intellect and, and brilliant uh, analytical abilities and rationality, you'll get there. <laughs> you, can get, you can get there. Um, uh, the other way I think is meditation where we just let go of the programming and have a direct experience of transrational knowing where we see the, uh, the infinite uh, beauty and oneness of life. And then we get it, we get it on that level. I think either one will work. The East and the West should complement each other and rationality and intuition should complement each other and support each other. But animal agriculture attacks both. Animal atta- agriculture attacks rationality. Uh, it subverts rationality. Uh, it creates a, a complete absurdity of science. I mean, science be, degenerates into complete nonsense like we see today. And, um, and we see, uh, and, and it attack, obviously attacks spirituality, it attacks the sacred feminine. Uh, it creates, uh, it creates uh, non-intelligence, uh, confusion, chaos, and misery. And that's what, it, that's what it thrives on. It's completely anti-rational, completely anti-logical, anti-spiritual. Animal agriculture is the epitome of what is demonic because it's completely contrary to the to the Tao, as you say. So um, I think it's good to see that. And uh, the West has been a little bit more influenced by animal agriculture than the East. And um, so that's why um, there's a little, it's a little bit, but I think both, both have been hit hard by, by animal agriculture. And we're trying to dig our way out from under that right now. And we can use all of these, whatever, whatever traditions and capacities we have can help us. But that's a great, great question. Thanks. Okay, I'll take another one. Great. Well, thank you so much. We have up next, and I'm not sure if it's M.A. or Ma, but uh, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, we're looking forward to your question as well, for Will. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Go right ahead. We can hear you now. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, my visual's gone. But anyway, um, I just want to thank you too, Will, for your presence all these men, low many years. And having read your book many, many years ago, uh, introduced by our dear friend, late Eleanor Wilson, um, I just um, want to ask you this question, which is, I think, the cow in the room. (laughs) Um, What are you uh, saying or or being able to offer to people regarding the uh, possible presence of a bioweapon that everyone's in fear of right now? And will veganism help us in that regard? Yeah, well, I think, you know, essentially all of this uh, that we see, you're referring to the bioweapon, I guess, the, you know, the pandemic and all that is really a manifestation of animal agriculture. As it, as it unfolds, uh, it, it turns back on, it's turning, it's, it's, it's getting more, more virulent than ever. Um, the violence, I think the real problem is the violence in animal agriculture. A lot of, a lot of vegans talk about uh, zoonotic transmission of disease, disease transmission from animals to humans and all of that. And I think this, I'm sure, you know, this, this whole perversion of hyper confining animals and misery and toxicity and overcrowdedness creates terrible, weird uh, situations energetically and probably microbially as well. The microbes, are, but the, the, the big problem is the toxins involved, the chemicals and the toxins. 
uh, that you know, agriculture requires and how that goes into the environment. And it goes into our bodies and makes us sick. And I think uh, in a way the you know, the, they are using, they're using a virus as a scapegoat as saying it's a virus. I don't think it's more, it's, it's chemical and other types of toxins. And, uh, and also it's um, turning human, humanity into the livestock. I mean, I think that's what's really what's happening. When we make other animals into livestock, we do that long enough, uh, we unfortunately become livestock ourselves. We become the ones ourselves. We lose our own uh, freedom because we keep stealing it from others. So I think um, this is really getting to the point now where it's really, it, it's critical that we all understand this process happening and not comply with uh, systems of, of violence um, that are being imposed on animals and on human beings. And to be a voice for animal liberation, to be a voice for human liberation, and to do the best we can to question the official, all the official narratives. I mean, I, I don't believe anything that comes from the mainstream media. I mean, maybe the weather or whatever, but the underlying, you know, I, I understand this. My father owned a newspaper. I was born and raised in the media. I, I know in my bones that basically the new, the, you cannot, my father could not run any articles that the advertisers would ob find objectionable. They would pull their ads, he, you know, they would advertise it with somebody else and he'd go out of business. So when we, the news is basically brought to us by the pharmaceutical industry, the petroleum industry, the big banking industries, the fast food industries, the science is owned by them, the media is owned by them, the government is owned by them, the narratives are owned by them. I've known this, the pharmaceutical industry is the greatest enemy that veganism has more than the meat and dairy industries. They make their money off sick and dying animals and people. And we don't believe anything they say, just don't believe anything they say ever. That it's, it's the opposite. I'll, I'll just say that. Okay, one, time for one more maybe. Great, thank you, Will, we appreciate that. We do have one more and uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Kaylee or Kylie. Uh, if you go ahead and unmute yourself, we look forward to your question for Will as well. Uh, hang on, Will. We're just waiting for the unmute button to happen. Uh, again, Kaylee or Kylie, if you can unmute on your end. Perfect. Great. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful lecture, teaching. You're terrific. Um, my question is, what do you say to people who say and who believe that veg vegetables have consciousness that they have feelings too. We raise plants to kill them and eat them. And all of the uh, experiments that were done way back at Duke University where they showed that uh, yogurt cultures responded in lead, lead clad rooms if part of it of that was in another room and had been injured or the plants that have uh, electronically uh, shown that they react to when people come in who have harmed them before. What do you say to those people? And what do you say to it? What do you think about that? Yeah, thank you. That's that's a good question. Yeah, I think you know I, I remember reading that the book, The Secret Life of Plants, and and uh, contemplating all these things. And I think basically uh, it may be you know obviously animals have fully functioning, especially vertebrate animals. But animals have nervous systems where we really are you know are mobile, so we have to feel pain. And so it's clearly uh, not good to harm animals unnecessarily. Plants uh, don't have that, those capacities, at least on the physical. But even if they do, perhaps they do, you know, that they can feel, we can use our intuition on that also. Um, the good news is, and I think I'm supposed to wrap up here. Um, the good news is that all of us can thrive on a plant-based way of eating. And that by doing that, we cause much less harm to plants. Right. According to biologists who study this, I, the estimates I've seen are somewhere around 100 to 150 trees a year. A vegan saves about 100 to 150 trees every year because the meat that we're eating, the animals and the dairy and so forth, have come from animals. And we have to cut down forests to grow the grain, to feed those. So cutting down forests, destroying you know, whole ecosystems. Uh, we, as, when we go vegan, we can minimize the amount of harm we cause to plants as well. So I think that's important to understand. I, I, I'm out of time here, I think so. Will, uh, speaking of your time, how incredibly gracious you've been with all of us. And I know I speak on behalf of everyone. Really, thank you so, so much. Just, just incredibly meaningful. And 
We're so thank thrilled you. to be back and joined us again this year. Just, just big thanks. <laughs>